Cool. All right, so um, for those of you who don't know me, um, good for you. You're about to, though, I'm afraid. Sorry. Um, so my name's Matt. Hi. Um, so just a little bit about me, not to, um, not to kind of be all like, oh, 15 minutes, I get to speak on whatever I want. I'm going to talk about me. Um, but just there's a reason why I want to just kind of let you know a little bit about myself, especially if we haven't met. Um, but so Matthew, um, my full name is Matthew Peter Charles McKay. Um, and uh, I love my second name because uh, Peter's my dude. Um, and I'm going to be talking about Peter in a little bit. Um, Matthew actually roughly translates as gift from God. So you're welcome. Um, <laughs> so they save the best for last this weekend. They save the best for last. When Sarah and I first met, I actually said, uh, yeah, I'm Matthew. I'm God's gift to women. And it clearly worked because, uh, you know, ended up marrying us. She was clearly impressed. Not. Um, so... Yeah, so I, uh, my wife and I and Andy, who spoke yesterday, we're from Gallery Church in Birmingham. And uh, on the side of serving at Gallery, uh, my wife and I run Rev UK along with Hannah and Lee and Will, who I can't see, but they're around. And another couple, Davey and Beth, who aren't here, unfortunately. But they've, uh, they're, they're part of the Meltdown crew too. But we run Revolution Reality UK. And um, if you were here in 2014, I think it was, it was Tommy Green of Sleeping Giant, uh, the vocalist of Sleeping Giant. He uh, was one of the seminar speakers. And um, I wasn't there at that meltdown, which I was really gutted about, actually. But um, Dave arranged for me to meet Tommy whilst he was over in the UK, and we made a connection there. And then uh, a couple of years, well, it was that year, actually, 2014, Tommy asked myself and a great friend of mine called John Derry, who's not here this weekend, but he's a meltdown regular, he asked us to set up Revolution Reality UK. Now, Tommy's church in Utah, in America, is Revolution Reality. It's more than just a church. It's a network of people um, throughout the world, really. And it's basically this just community. And they all know each other, and it's a nice little family network. Um, and we wanted to do something in the UK that was um, more than just a one-year event. Because we've got this amazing community that we have now of Meltdown. We're a family. We know each other. Um, but it's just like a one-year thing. So we were like, we need to meet up more regularly. So slowly but surely, we're starting to build this revolution reality uh, UK community. And uh, my wife and I planted uh, Revolution Reality Midlands in Birmingham, and we use our church venue uh, two months ago. Um, so we just launched that, which is really great. And just reaching out to people in the subculture of you know, the metal community and the hardcore community, and just reaching out to people in those areas um, in the same way that kind of Meltdown does. So that's a little bit about myself. Um, and the reason why I just wanted to let you kind of tell you a little bit about who I am and what I do is because every time that I've gone to a, a seminar or a conference and I haven't known who the speaker is, I've, uh, there's been some great profound truths that I've heard that have impacted me and some really tweetable uh, phrases and just stuff that's really impacted me. But honestly, the, people, the, the times that I've been most impacted is when I know the person that's speaking because I know their journey, I know their story, I know who they am, who they am, who they are. I can't even speak. <laughs> Holy Spirit, help me. Um, right, exactly. So, um, what I want to talk about today is kind of closeness. Um, and if we could just get my slide up, my kind of my, my the thing I want to talk about today, I've called it access all areas. So, Ollie, there you go. Anybody recognise these two dudes? <laughs> totally. Oh wait, no, that's Bill and Ted, eh? Anyways. Whoa, dude, I <laughs> love it. So um, that is exactly who I would have been had I been born in like the 60s or 70s. Um, growing up in the 80s, I would have been like, I definitely would have been uh, one of those two. Anyway, access all areas. Um, I'm getting the feeling that a lot of you have come here and there are still some people who are feeling maybe like, they haven't quite got what they've come for yet. And that's not because anybody that's previously spoken hasn't said something that's, that's important and profound, but they just, there's just this one thing that they just are like desperately seeking God over or something that's troubling them. And maybe some of you t this weekend have already felt like you've got what you came here for or there's been healing or something amazing that God's done. Whatever you're feeling right now, I'm here to tell you that God has got more for you still. There's still more for you. 
whoever you are, whatever your circumstance and situation, okay? I believe that God wants to give you more of heaven today, right now. I believe that God wants to release to you the fullness of your destiny and your purpose and the fullness of your relationship with him now, today. And there's a lot of people who think, you know what, I'm... When I get to heaven, I'm going to have the fullness of the glory of God. I'm going to be in full relationship with Jesus. God wants to give you full access right now. Sarah, um, I love you so much, but you basically just stole my preach with what you were talking about in communion, about having access to to God, right? This is what it all comes down to. Um, John 10.10 says that I have come. This is Jesus. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. He didn't say have it a little bit and have a kind of good life. The fullness of of you walking out your journey here on earth while you're in this flesh vessel, God wants to give you the kingdom, the glory and the power of the kingdom here now. The fullness that John talks about is an eternal fullness and it's deposits. I believe that God wants to deposit something in you today from heaven. He wants to put deposits from heaven into you today. So my chips are all in right now. I'm willing to gamble everything and say that uh, we've already seen we've already seen God move this weekend, um, but I'm willing to put it all out on the line and say God's going to impact you, not because of me or anything that I'm going to say, but I just believe the truths from heaven, and we just I just pray right now, God, that Holy Spirit, you would just calm our minds, forget about what's happened this weekend so far and all the craziness. I pray, Lord, you would just still our hearts, still our minds, soften our hearts, and we just have open arms and say whatever it is that you want us to receive we receive it gladly humbly and confidently and we just say lord i'll receive whatever it is thank you lord you know god says knock and you will find uh, knock and i'll open the door seek and you and, and you will find me um he doesn't say knock and i might open seek and i might peer my head around the corner you know it's a bring me the horizon uh lyric if you know the band bring me the horizon i kind of love him kind of hate him i don't hate him but Anyway, but they've got a, a lyric that says, um, I'll bow to your king when he shows himself. And I'm just like, I understand that, but yo, I'm not waiting for God to physically manifest in front of me before I believe in him. And I'm not waiting for him to show up before I start to move and do stuff. Um, so if you knock and you seek, you'll find him. In Matthew 22, the Sadducees and the Pharisees ask Jesus, which is the greatest commandment? They're trying to trick him. There's like 60, there's like hundreds of them. There's loads of commandments, and they're trying to trick him and say, which is the most important? Because if he says the wrong one, then, you know, he's clearly not God, as he, you know, was claiming. So um, he says, love God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. And then he says, and the second is love others. And from all the rest of the laws and all the rest of the prophets hang on these two commandments. So it's all about love. And if there's one thing that revolution reality and Tommy has taught me, and it's, it's about loving well. And being open to God. And so if I want to leave a legacy behind, I pray that my legacy that I leave behind when I go home to Jesus is that I loved people well. I loved God well, and I loved people well. Um, So the scripture that I want to turn to, if you've got your Bibles, if you've got your uh, phones, tablets, whatever it is, we've got it on the screen as well. So if you don't have it, we're going to turn to Matthew uh, 16, 13 to 20. So I'll give you time to flick and find that. If you haven't got a Wi-Fi connection on your phone, we've got it on the board. Okay, ready? No, 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 no. Okay. Oh, you've got the Greek and the Aramaic and it all. All right. Okay. Sure, you're good. Okay. So Matthew 16, verses 13 to 20. All right, Lord, speak to us. Okay. You good? 16, Matthew 16, 13 to 20. All right. So this is Peter declares that Jesus is the Messiah. So let's journey, people. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, everybody say Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea. I'm impressed. Well done. Like I was there like 10 minutes, like Caesarea, Caesarea Philippi. Anyway, when he came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people... Who does everyone say that the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist. Others say the Son of Man is Elijah. And still others say that the Son of Man is Jeremiah or one of the prophets. 
So there was speculation about who the Messiah, the Son of Man was, and some people thought it was these people. Then Jesus turned to his disciples and said, but what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Verse 17, Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you, and I tell you that you are Peter. And by the way, Peter uh, roughly translates as the word rock. See the significance here? So he says, you are Peter. And on this rock, on this Peter, on the Peter standing in front of me, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. All right, that last verse, it's a weird one. We're not talking about that today. That's a different preach. So there's so much to unpack in this verse and I absolutely love it. It's one of my favorite ones. Um, just because it's a nice story. It's just really nice. Um, so a couple of things to unpack. First of all, Jesus, this is the part where Jesus is recognized as not just another prophet. He's not recognized as Jeremiah or Elijah or whatever, yeah? This is where he is recognized as not just another prophet or a forerunner. This is the first time in Matthew's gospel that actually the titles of Messiah and Son of God are joined together in the same kind of passage in acknowledgement of Jesus' identity, all right? This is the first time Messiah and Son of God come together, okay? And ironically, funnily enough, the only other occurrence of this is actually when Jesus is on trial, and that very identity of being both Messiah and Son of God is what causes him to be found guilty and be put to death, which is, I just think is pretty cool. Um, and obviously, most importantly, this is the part, this is the, uh, you know, the passage of Scripture where Peter is declared as the rock upon which Jesus builds his church. So in this passage, Jesus receives his calling and he receives an authority. All right. Really important. He receives his calling to be the, you know, the, the rock on which the church is built. And he's given authority because it says in verse 19, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Okay. So why was Peter's response so special that it would prompt Jesus to bestow this huge anointing? I mean, me and Sarah just like planted a church. Like we just planted this community thing. I felt the weight of that. I didn't feel ready for it in ways I did, but in ways I didn't. And I was like, oh, we're starting a little community of a gathering of people. Imagine being told that you're going to be like the foundation of the church of the world. Like that's, that's heavy. So his response must have elicited what elicited Jesus to do this. Um, there's two reasons that I want to unpack today of why Jesus would have done this and why he would have given him this anointing. First of all, in verse 16, Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Now, this was massively humble especially for a man of that day and age in Jewish tradition, a Jewish man to say that, that he was the Messiah, to put yourself in that culture underneath another man. We know that Jesus was more than just a man, but to say that someone else was higher. I mean, it's difficult even today. Like, you know, um, I used to do jiu-jitsu. Um, I don't know if I was any good at it. And if you don't know what jiu-jitsu is, it's basically rolling around on the floor with other sweaty men trying to, like, kill each other. Um, and... There's a definitely a bravado that can be at stake. And you've got to be careful with your ego uh, because essentially if someone chokes you or gets you in an armbar, if you don't tap out and submit, they'll keep applying pressure and you're either going to tap, you're going to snap, nope, snap or nap, right? So you're either going to go to sleep or get something broken. So you have to submit. But it's really difficult. And I said, I did a competition once. Uh, I trained for like six months and I was like, I'm, you know, I just want to win just one match, just one, just one bout. And I was like, I'll never tap out. If someone gets me in a choke, I ain't dying at a tap. I'm going to just go to sleep. I'm, I'm, someone got me in a choke. And what did I do? I tapped out. But it, it hurts your ego. And in our flesh, we don't want to put ourselves beneath somebody else. And that's just in today's culture. Back then, there was probably way more shame at stake for doing that. So it's a massive thing to note. Not just the fact that he declares that he is Messiah, but it's, you know, just the context of it is massive. 
Um, and just as a side note, have we done that lately? I know we've been worshipping and stuff this weekend, but have we lately declared that, that Jesus is Lord above everything? Is he higher than everything? If we haven't, maybe it's time to do that again today. Just as a side note, what's above Jesus right now in your life? What needs to come lower? He is first and I am second. Okay. Um, So, once Peter acknowledged that Jesus is Lord, Jesus gave him the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Now, the Rev guys, um, it's it's pretty lame actually, but some of the Rev crew have got a gang tattoo, and it's a key on the shoulder. So, I don't know if you can see. Oh, you can't. A little key on the shoulder. And the reason why that we've got this is because keys represent authority, all right? If you've got the keys, so Jesus says, verse 19, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And uh, And he says, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. If I've got the keys, that's authority. I have access to the room. I have access to the building. And I have access to all of the resources and facilities within that room, within that building. Yeah? In Isaiah, there's a, there's a faithful servant called Eliakim. Uh, and God places on his shoulder, and I quote, it says, I place on his shoulder the key to the house of David. Whatever he opens, no one can shut. And whatever he shuts, no one can open. If you've got the key, you can lock it, you can open it. And no one can open it without the key. No one can shut it and lock it. No one can open it, no one can close it unless you've got the key. And the good news is that this key isn't just for Peter. And these keys are not just for Eliakim. In Matthew 18, 18, it says, uh, Jesus says once again, um, whatever you bind will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose, he repeats this scripture. Uh, It's repeated in Matthew, but he's not talking to Peter at this point. He's talking to the people. This authority and these keys are for you to take. These are yours for the taking. Uh, And I believe there are people that are walking all over the world, Christians, and they don't realize the power that they have. They don't realize the authority that God's given to them, and they're walking defeated. You're not meant to be defeated. You're not meant to be defeated. You're meant to have this power. Um, A friend of mine, Ed Jervis, another Meltdown regular who unfortunately can't be here, he he and I run like this little project um, called ALTV. Um, Whether it actually ever gets out there, I don't know. But we've basically just done a bunch of interviews with like, loads of people like Tommy and Matty Montgomery of For Today and some cool like, people within you know, the culture. And we had an amazing opportunity to be able to interview uh, Brian Welch, head from Corn, And it was, uh, it was the tour, it was last, last year or the year before, two years ago maybe. It was about two or three months before the bombings of the MEN Arena. And we were stood in the, in the foyer where the bomb went off. So looking back on that now, it was... <sighs> anyway... Um, so me and Ed and a couple of the friends, we went to the MEN Arena. It was Corn, it was Limp Biscuit, and a hardcore band called Madball, and it was a sick show. Um, but we got to the we got to the the venue, and um, we knew that we had passes, press passes for the interview, but we didn't have them on us, so we couldn't actually get access. We went up to the ticket office, and there was no information about us, and we were like, "Oh man, we're not going to be able to get in. Like we're not we're not, not going to be able to do this." Um, and about 10, 15 minutes went by, and eventually they tracked someone down who had our passes. Anyway, so we went to the uh, kind of like the gate to go in. We had the passes. It said press. It said family and friends. And I was like, sick. <laughs> That's so cool. Um, anyway, so we go through. They check our bags. And then the tour manager from Corn comes and meets us and takes us through a side door and down this secret elevator and took us to the basement where all the scaffolding was. It basically just looked like this. A little bit, a bit more scaffolding. But... We were like, this is so cool. Like, we get to see, like, all this stuff. And then we eventually came to Korn's dressing room. And I was like, oh, my God. Had Korn's logo on the door. I was like, "Ah, I'm not even a big Korn fan. Like, I didn't really listen to Korn growing up. But I was like, these are, like, megastars. And it's, side note, it's really easy to idolize people, even if you don't even know who they are. Just be wary of that. But, um... So we got in, and there are Korn, like all of them. Jonathan Davis, the singer, who's really quiet, by the way. He doesn't really talk to anybody. But they were all there. And I was like, oh, my gosh. So we did the interview and stuff. But here's the thing. I had access into Corn's dressing room. Down the hall was Limp Biscuit's dressing room. If I tried to get into Limp Biscuit's dressing room, I would have been subdued quicker than I tapped out in my jiu-jitsu competition. Like, they would have leaped on me. I did not have access into that room, into Limp Biscuit's dressing room. I had, I had authority and power 
in some places, but not all places, okay? And the reason I say this is because on one end of the spectrum, we've got people who are not living in the authority and power that God wants to give to them. And it's like, yo, take it. On the other end, you've got people who think they have maybe too much authority. All I need to say is one name. I don't like name dropping, and I'm not about that, but it's clear and evident. People like Westboro Baptist. If you don't know about Westboro, they're a church that are not very, they don't display God's love in a way that I think they, I think they should. <clears throat> people think they have too much power and authority, and it can go the other way. If we've got an attitude of, I can do whatever I want because I have God's authority, I don't need to tell you that that lacks, that lacks maturity and lacks humility, yeah? We're only given the authority because God gives it to us, but we're not to abuse it. It's dangerous. If we're preaching the gospel and not caring about who we're hurting in the process, that's not God's way. I'm telling you now, if that's your theology, it got messed up somewhere along the way. And it's okay, but if we're doing things and we're thinking we're reaching people, but we're hurting them, I'm not talking about if you tell someone Jesus loves them and they want to punch you, that's obviously persecution. But if you're like... If you're purposely going out of your way, like Westboro Baptist, they will go to people's funerals and just like have God hates fag signs. That's not loving the people. And you're going into their culture, you're going into their environment, and you're just like kicking the hornet's nest. If we're going into someone's culture, we've got to be respectful. And remember, think of it, think of it this way. When Jesus wanted to do miracles and he wanted to preach the gospel and he wasn't accepted, did he continue to do that? Did he continue to preach did he continue to say that he was the way? Did he continue to perform miracles? He left. He wiped his feet. He didn't continue to upset people. He was like, okay, on the way. Just, to, just I don't want to you know, go on to that for too long, but it's just like, let's just be sensitive to people and just love them well. And uh, if there was ever a tweetable phrase that I was going to say today, this is it. Um, power is the evidence of authority. If you think you've got authority and you try to do something, there will be no, and you don't have the authority, there'll be no power behind it. You think you're going to be effective, it won't be effective if you don't have the authority or the power. Donald Trump doesn't have access to every room in the White House or Pentagon. There are going to be rooms that maybe he can't go into. I'm pretty sure that's the case. In, in either way, positions like being a pastor, Pastors should not be in charge of safeguarding. That's not an authority that they should have. If there's a meeting that's discussing the pastor's salary, the pastor's not in that meeting. There are certain things that people you think would have ultimate authority and access to. It's not always, it's not always right. So all I'm just saying is just let's just be humble. Okay, anyway, moving on. So authority, power, it's yours for the taking. The second reason why Jesus um, bestows this anointing on Peter is A, he declares that he is Lord, and B, in verse 17, Ollie, my dude, what are you doing? I'll leave you. It's all good, Ollie. There you go. Uh, I love you, dude. <laughs> um, he says in verse 17, This was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my f- flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. Simon Peter knew who Jesus was, not because he read about it, not because he learned it from the teachers and the rabbis. There are so many people who have read about Jesus, but just still don't get it, right? It was through being near to Jesus. It was through spending time with him. I'm going to say this word, and it's a scary word, and people don't always like it. I'm going to say two words. Peter was vulnerable with Jesus, and he was intimate with Jesus. And I know that's difficult because I've struggled with it. Opening up to God and opening up to others can be super difficult, especially if we've been hurt by the church. We feel like angry at God. I get it. I really get it. But it was, he knew, Jesus recognized, you didn't learn this in the flesh, in the earthly. You learned it by being close to me. You know who I am. You don't just know about me. You know me. All right. If I said I've got this friend uh, called Joe, um, yo, Matt, I've got a friend called Joe. He's awesome, dude. You really need to meet him. Um, I I think he works 
in a factory. I'm not sure. I, I can't remember what he does. Um, I think he likes sports, maybe. He's just a really cool dude. You should get to know him. Um, I didn't really know kind of how to get in touch with him or like his number or whatever, but I just know he's a cool dude. Have I sold that well? Probably not. Dude, you need to meet my wife. She is the coolest. She's like so selfless. She's so loving. She will give you a bet, like a place to stay at our house. She'll feed you. She'll pray for you. When she walks in the room, the presence of God is there. She'll change her life. She's absolutely amazing, dude. I know my wife. I know who she is. If we don't know Jesus in here, we know him in here, but not in here, how can we tell people about him? How can we talk about somebody we don't really know, right? Same with Dave. I know Dave. Dave's been there at my darkest times, and I've opened up to Dave, and I've formed a relationship with Dave. Being near to Jesus and spending time with him requires us to be vulnerable. If you're sat in a room with somebody that you don't really know, you don't really want to talk to, it's a bit of a, bit of a flat atmosphere. Yeah. Hmm. We have a trouble ve- being vulnerable. Some of us do, not all of us. I am an absolute weeping mess sometimes. Um, but I know it's, you know, as humans, we have trouble ve- being vulnerable. And as humans, we tend to define things by what we're not rather than what we are. Bradley, tell me about yourself. You could, you could list probably more things that you're not than what you are. Because as humans, we like to be modest. Well, I kind of play a bit of guitar. I kind of sing a little bit. I'm in a band. Yo, I'm in a band. I absolutely love it. I love to sing. I don't know if I'm any good. I'm sure I am. People tell me I'm good. As humans, we tend to define things by what we're not first. Maybe not all of us. I pray that you will have confidence to be confident in who you are in God, and your identity in Jesus. Maybe we think we're not as holy or skilled or talented or intelligent or creative or confident or bold. I never thought that I could do this until I realized one day, I can do this. God's given me the authority and power to do this. And I just stepped and I was obedient. I didn't, I didn't ask to preach. Dave came up to me and asked me, asked me, and I was like, I'm not a theologian. I'm not, like I didn't go to Bible college. I didn't go to uni. I studied music technology and haven't done anything with it. I work in a, as a trainer in a call center. But I know that God's given me certain qualities. As a job, I'm a trainer. I stand up in front of groups of people all the time. I probably don't read the Bible as much as I should. But I know that God's got this for me. Anyway, it's not about me. I'm just saying, I'm not saying that I'm amazing. I'm just saying, just be confident in what God's given to us. Too many of us fear that we're not worthy of human connection, let alone a godly connection. But you absolutely are worthy. You're absolutely worthy because he made you worthy. Right? We talk about, I'm unworthy, Lord. And I get that. Well, God says, God, didn't, God wouldn't have gone to the cross. He wouldn't have gone and tore that curtain down if he didn't think you were worth it. Right? So we talk about humility. I'm unworthy, Lord. You know, I'm a sinner. I'm nothing without you. And yes and amen. But he says, you're worth dying for. A million times. <sighs> You're worth going to the cross for a million times. He'd do it over and over again if he, if he needed to. But he didn't. It's done. You're worth it. <sighs> Jesus. And then there's the men. Oh, us men. I've already mentioned about not tapping out. We think we, you know, there's this stigma in the world about taking on the world all by yourself, not asking for help being Superman. We pay a heavy price for that. We pay a heavy price. We feel isolated. We don't ask for help. We're too proud. I love it when I see grown men with massive beards weeping because I know God's doing something cool and there's no shame in it. There's no shame in it. And honestly, the one thing that I could probably take away from revolution reality more than anything is the ability to be vulnerable with somebody and to have an intimate moment as one man with another man and just be like looking at each other and say, I love you, mate. I love you. You know me and you see me and, I, and I, I'm valued and I'm seen when I'm around you. I know you see me and I'm, re- and I'm not just a ghost in the room. And just being vulnerable with somebody, it's just hugely, hugely powerful. Peter, Peter and, and Jesus had a relationship. 
But the Bible talks about John being Jesus' favorite. They were like, to have that with another, with another guy is, it's something that, that just men just, I don't know. It's just this stigma. Anyway, um, I want to point out the whole Superman, Batman thing is a fallacy because Superman and Batman were orphans, right? If anyone's into superheroes, they were orphans. I'm not called to be an orphan. You're not called to be an orphan. If you're feeling like an orphan and you're feeling like you're not part of community or you're feeling like God's distant, <laughs> you're not called to be an orphan. And if that's how you feel right now, I want to pray for you at some point. And if, if that's what you want, come and talk to me because you, you're not called to have an orphan spirit. You're called to have a good father. And you are not an orphan. He fathers the orphan. We sing it in the worship songs. Yeah. Let's declare that. Let's hold on to that truth. Um, orphans. Okay. We're made to be in relationship with him, not being an orphan. In Genesis, they walked with God naked. They were naked with God. They were vulnerable with him. They journeyed with him vulnerably. The more intimate we are with Jesus, the more we receive a revelation of who he is. The closer we are, the more we get to know him. The more time I spend with my wife, the better I get to know her. And the more that he invests in us as well. Yeah, me and my wife spend time with each other. She'll invest time into me. I'll invest time into her. I'll tell her how good she is at things. I'll draw the potential out of her. I want to see her do well. I tell her that she's awesome at this and she's awesome at that, even when she thinks she's not. And likewise, we receive his confidence. If you want something, if you want your destiny, if you don't know what it is that you want to do for the Lord yet, or maybe you do know what it is. God wants to give that to you. God wants to release that anointing to you. Just be obedient and say yes. And if it's not the right thing for you, he'll send you down the right path. I wanted to be in a big metal band. Maybe it'll happen, I don't know. But I love screaming and just playing punk rock. It's not happened yet. I haven't got a band. And I honestly thought that that was my calling on my life. I honestly thought, yeah, you know, there's not many Christian screamers in the UK. Like, maybe I'm going to be the next sleeping giant or the next four today or the next whatever. It hasn't happened. But I've got an incredible wife. I've got an amazing friends and family and community around me. And I'm probably doing more for the kingdom this way than I would if I was just... I'm not saying it's, you're not doing great things if you're in a band. Yes, you are. You're impacting people's lives. I love Moosery. I love River Spark. I love all the bands that I played this weekend. And you're doing amazing things. What I'm saying is, just say yes. If it's not the right thing, he's not going to let you walk down a path that's going to end in you not being happy and not being joyful in your calling. Yeah, he'll take you down the right path. <clears throat> I just want to say that you can bring the presence of God with you wherever you go. The Meltdown Hospitality Team, you are amazing. I don't know where Raph is. You guys are absolutely awesome. You bring such powerful part of meltdown seriously you're all you're absolutely amazing because you're the ones that see everybody probably more than everyone everyone comes to the coffee bar yeah you know you're important and i'm really pleased that you know how integral you are what a, a, a vital part of this you are you bring the presence of god when you give someone a cup of tea and at gallery church and at rev we 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 know that too and that's why we make such an emphasis on the welcome and the hospitality side of it because it's so important I'm not saying don't read the Bible. I'm saying we need to spend time with Jesus. Yeah. Definitely read the Bible. Definitely, definitely read the Bible. It's really important. But if we're not putting the word aside and just sitting. And I'm guilty of not doing this as much as I should. I pray in the car and in the shower. But maybe I, maybe I need to. Maybe I'm preaching to myself right now. But we need to just spend time with the Lord. The truths are in the Bible. His presence yeah. is in the time. Having a supernatural experience in an encounter with God is the norm and it should be the norm. Could you imagine? It would be so weird if the disciples were like, if God didn't show up in Acts. If there was a part of the book of Acts where it was like, and then the, Acts went, the, the apostles went out and did something and then God didn't show up. Like it was the norm for them. They were so in tuned to the supernatural realm, realm. You go to Eastern countries like Africa, even people who aren't, they're all so much more in tune to it. And this Western culture has just bombarded us with entertainment, with indecent images, everything. It's just thrown at us. And the connection, the frequencies between God, they start to get distorted and start to get dumbed down and toned down. Let's spend time in God's presence. Let's just let the Holy Spirit just fill us up.
It would be weird if God didn't move and God didn't do wonders. Yeah, I'm not waiting for Jesus to come back to judge everybody before I can be with him in my fullness and my relationship with him. I'm not waiting for him to come back to, to, to grab that fullness that he wants. He came, Jesus, in the flesh. He came so that people could be with him literally, physically right there. And then he left. But he left the Holy Spirit so he could be everywhere. Because Jesus was, was a man. He could only be in one place at one time in his physical form. The Holy Spirit is everywhere. He can be with all of us anywhere we go. I'm not waiting for him to come back again in the physical for me to have that fullness of that relationship with him. I believe the church has been fed some really poor theology over the years. And death is not my savior. I've already died once. I've already died once. My old me is dead. I'm not waiting for death to be... I mean, death is the gateway to heaven. But like, I'm not waiting for death to be the one that says, yes, now you can have the fullness. I'm not waiting to die. I'm grabbing it. I'm grabbing it. There are two billion little Jesuses all over the planet. There's a lot of us. Could you just imagine what would happen if we loved, we just loved really well at the exact same time on planet Earth? Could you imagine if it was just like, oh my gosh, if every Christian just did one amazing act of love and kindness, what would happen? What would happen? What would planet Earth look like? What I want to do now is just, uh, is just spend some time um, just being in God's presence. Um, what I've got is, um, I made these. <laughs> so y'all better come and take them. Because it took me a long time. Um, <clears throat> Sarah, can you just give us a hand? I've got these lanyards. And it says access all areas on them. And I want you guys to come and take these. Because this is your authority. This is you saying, yes, I'm taking it. I'm taking the access to you, Lord. Full relationship with you. Full relationship. I want all of you. I want all of you. And I want all of the power and authority that you're going to give to me. Everything that you want to give me, whatever power it is, whatever authority and access it is, I'm saying yes. Yes. But if you want one, you're going to have to come and you're going to have to kneel at the cross. And I've, I literally, I was like, Dave, is there, a, is there a cross, like a big, 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 big cross, like on site? And he was like, nope. So I went over and I went and I just found this and I just made it. It's cool, isn't it? It's cute. Oh, I just stabbed myself. It's not so cute anymore. <laughs> not today, Satan. G- Peter declared that Jesus was the Messiah that he was the son of God. Jesus declared that he was Lord. That's the first step. We can only gain that if we declare that he's the one. Every, everything that follows on from then is awesome, but it all starts with saying, yeah, God, you are Lord. I'm putting you first. I'm following you, even when I've got a splinter. And the second thing is just spending time with him. This is your yes. This is you saying, yes, I'm going to be vulnerable with you. I'm going to be intimate with you. And I promise you, because it's not me that's promised it, it's him. You'll get it. And he will take you down a path that you never thought your life could go down. There is more for you. Your anointing and your calling, if you're already walking in it, this still applies to you. The more we press in, the more intimate we are with him, the more he downloads, the more he deposits into us. Okay. Um, anyone here play guitar? Anyone? I thought all of me, yeah. Someone come up, I'm sure they won't mind. Just doodle around. Yeah, go on Bradley. Okay, cool. Um, we're just going to spend some time just in God's presence right now. Um, when you're ready, come and just kneel at the cross. If you can't kneel, that's absolutely fine. Just come and just grab Grab these lanyards. Um, and you know what? I, I mentioned that being vulnerable is really... Uh, I don't have a pick. I'm sorry. I do have a pick. Yo, I've got a, I've got a, I've got a meltdown pick, yo. Okay, so... Uh, 
and you're good. If you find it really, really difficult to be vulnerable with God, um, and you find it really difficult to be vulnerable at all, I, I completely get that. Um, I just want to say this. Remind yourself of the times that God's been really good to you. Just remind yourself of the times that God's pulled through. Just remind yourself of the things that, even just being born, the air that you breathe, the fact that there's just the right amount of oxygen, the fact that gravity holds everything together, just the little things. Maybe it's big things that he's done. Maybe it's the breakthrough. Maybe it's the promises that are yet to come. Just remind yourself of the times when God's been good, like an old friend. Maybe it's been a while since you've spent time with God. Maybe it's been a while since you've said hello to Jesus. But he's like an old friend where there's no time has passed between when you've, maybe it's been a year, two years. You know, if you've, have you ever had a friend where it's like, oh, I haven't seen you for ages, but like, it's like we're never apart. In 2 Peter, Paul writes to the Galatians and he says to them that he has to stir up. He, he says, I'm, I'm stirring up in you a pure and I'm stirring up your pure and sincere minds. And some translations say uh, sincere understanding. And then he goes on to say, I'm stirring these pure thoughts and these, these understandings up by way of reminder, by refreshing your memory. These sincere thoughts, these pure thoughts, these are the beautiful memories that you have with God. Start to remind yourself of the goodness that God has. Refresh your memory. Thank you, Lord. He's not a God that will snap your head off when you come to him. seek and you'll find he's a good father we sing it and we believe it jesus is good he's a good friend he's a good friend god just soften our hearts soften our hearts help us to undress not literally physically (laughs) please but help us to walk naked in the garden with you, Lord. Help us to walk naked again. Help us not to be ashamed of anything. Help us to bear our scars. Thank you, Jesus. I just want to encourage someone here. Your greatest wounds are your greatest victories. Your greatest wounds will be your greatest victories. Just show me your scars, I'll show you mine. Let's relate over how much life sucks sometimes. Let's be real, let's be authentic, let's be honest. Our life's, life's crap sometimes, let's be honest. We're not in heaven yet. This is earth, this isn't heaven. But God's good. Jesus, you are everything. Jesus, you are everything. Help us to love you better. You know, Scripture says that the Holy Spirit helps us to love him better. Like, we shouldn't need help. God's done everything for us. He made a way. He created us. He created us to never perish. We shouldn't have to have help to love him. What kind of... God deserves everything, yet yet we don't love him as well as we should. But the Holy Spirit helps us to love him better. How incredible is that? He even helps us to love him back. You're so good, Lord. Jesus, help us to love you better. Help us to be in love with you so much more. We just bear everything right now. We just bear our scars. We bear our hurt. We bear our pain. We bear our desires. We bear our passions to you. Nothing's hidden from you, Lord. Nothing's hidden. Nothing's hidden. Lord, I just pray right now for anointing and blessing on everyone. If you want to come and grab a lanyard, I'll move out the way. But you've got to come to the cross to get it. If you want that anointing, you want that access, God's going to give it to you. But you've got to declare he's Lord.
let him have access to everything. When you give him access to all of you, he gives you access to all of him, the whole of it. Come on, Lord. Thank you, Jesus.